In this video, we're gonna share some techniques of how to actually implement or do a prescribed fire. If you missed them, the previous two episodes were the equipment needed and how to have a good plan to do a safe and effective prescribed fire. And when I say effective, it's meeting the mission. It's not just burning to burn, but you should burn with a prescription or a mission to achieve a certain goal. There are two basic forms of prescribed fire. Remember, there's a prescription. It's not just a wildfire that lightning started. There are backing fires and there are head fires. I'm gonna start talking about the backing prescribed fire. Backing fires should be the most commonly used form of prescribed fire. They're much easier to control and they're a little bit lower intensity. They're backing into the wind or they're backing downhill. The topography sometimes can be a stronger factor in how fast the fire goes and how intense it is than the wind direction. So we're gonna talk about that first. If you're in an area like here at the Proving Grounds that has pretty steep topography, a fire backing down the hill typically goes about 16 times slower than a fire up the hill. If you light it at the top of the ridge and you're just backing it down, boy, it can take hours to get even down to the bottom of a hill, but it's very controllable and it's just slowly going. That flame height is never getting too tall, depending on the amount of fuel there, and it's just easing through it and sometimes gets better consumption because it actually stays in one place a little bit longer. It's not a flash fire that just burns through there. A backing fire is designed to a, be very controllable. B, to get good consumption with minimal flame height and minimal heat so you don't damage residual trees, trees you want to leave on site. You've got a nice oak flat or an oak savanna in an area and you don't want to damage those trees. Oaks have thinner bark than pines. They can't take as much heat or flame height as a pine tree can and still survive or be productive. So we're gonna use that backing fire through a lot of oak timber to keep the flame height and the heat levels down. It's a lower intensity fire. A head fire would be moving uphill or with the wind. And because it's moving uphill or with the wind, the heat is going to fuel that has not been consumed yet. It's preheating the fuel, removing some moisture out of there, getting that fuel more conditioned to burn. So it's a little bit more difficult to control because a head fire could blow a spark into an area where there's fuel. When you're using a backing fire, it's backing into the wind or downhill, the fuel's already consumed. That's a black area, that's a massive fire break. There's nothing more to burn should a spark jump up there. But with a head fire, with the wind pushing or it going uphill, it could blow a spark way ahead of the fire line and start another fire. It could be a group of head fires leapfrogging up the mountain. That's gonna have a little bit more intensity, a much faster moving fire, again, up to 16 times faster, much higher flame height. It's just growing and crawling. It's just grabbing more fuel. Remember Solomon wrote, fire's never satisfied. It's just gonna go really fast. The flame height is gonna be much taller. And if there's timber in the area, especially oak or hardwood timber you're trying to save, what you see is as it's going uphill, it will make a little eddy or go behind the tree and make a chimney effect. The fire scars are oftentimes much taller on the uphill side of the tree than the downhill, because once it goes around it, there's a draft going up. It's called the chimney effect, and you can flat kill some hardwoods. And if that's your goal, a head fire may be the tool for you. I commonly use strip head fires. I'll use a combination of these. That's a little bit more advanced. I'll use a backing fire on the top of the ridge or in the direction the wind's blowing, and get a big fire break, depending on the amount of fuel, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 yards. So there's a big black area that if a spark blows in there, there's nothing to burn. And then to speed it up, because backing fires are so slow, Daniel or I or one of our team could grab a drip torch and you know walk 5, 10, 15 yards from that backing fire, set a fire line, let it rush uphill. And you can be very creative. You can actually paint the canvas. The land becomes your canvas. And if I've got a big oak tree I want to save. I'm lighting a strip head fire. I'll walk up to that tree and then go back downhill. So it's a backing fire around that one tree. 
and then maybe 10 yards away from it, it's a head fire going through a bunch of saplings I want to set back. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, PH Outdoors, Moultrie Mobile, Steel, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, Fourth Arrow, Soil Pro Outdoors, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Burris Optics, and Redneck Hunting Wines. There are more types of fire, but they're all built around a backing fire or a head fire, such as a strip head fire. One thing that you almost never want to do is called the ring fire. Typically with the ring fire, you start on the downwind or the uphill side and people just take off walking, ring the whole unit and come together. That becomes a wicked head fire because fire is drawing air. So the fire up here and the fire down here starts rushing towards each other. And in the middle, it can be a wicked tall tornado of fire. They're all fighting for air, pulling, cheating around there. And anything in the middle is probably not gonna survive. The type of fire you plan to use is really dependent not only on topography, but the fuel load. For example, you're burning an old CRP field or a grass field, you may use a ring fire once you've got that downwind side all blacked out and you know a spark's not gonna jump further than that based on the current wind speed. To get it done quicker, you may ring it or use big strips. Your strips can be much wider of a head fire. If you're just burning leaves in an area and there's not many trees you want to save, you may be able to be larger strip head fires or a head fire through there if it's really flat land. If you're, you know, somewhere where it's really flat and there's not much wind, to get that fire to move at all, you may need to use a head fire. So again, the context, the local conditions are critical for making the plan of using prescribed fire to meet a habitat improvement goal. Humidity is a big factor and humidity can change even in the middle of a fire. If you've got a closed canopy area, that's gonna hold a bit more humidity and you may have to be a little bit more aggressive to get that fuel to burn. And all of a sudden you come to an area where it's open, the canopy's been open for whatever reason. Well, there's probably gonna be more grass or fine fuel in that area. That fire could carry more or there may be some saplings in that open area and you wanna drop way below it and set a head fire to try to knock those back. So it's not just the whole unit, within the unit, the context or the conditions can change and that's where we really like, our favorite fire type is a strip head fire. So we can match the type of fire we need site by site, 10 foot block by 10 foot block for the goals we wanna accomplish. A strip head fire for wildlife habitat improvement programs is an extremely valuable tool. Here at the Proving Grounds, we have to be a bit more technical because of the topography. We may have a ridge coming down, but then there's a finger ridge coming off that at 90 degrees. So we just can't light the whole thing or we'll rush up the two sides of that T ridge sticking in there. We have need to walk out that ridge and light a backing fire going off. So lay it a land, wind speed and the humidity are all the factors that need to be considered when igniting a fire site by site. And we are making calls all the time now. Daniel and I have been burning for many, many years. We're very comfortable with this and we can make those calls as we're walking around the drip torch. If in doubt, it's always safer to let a fire back than a head fire. Head fires are usually the ones that get out of control. This is simply meant for education and information. It's a description. It's not you watch this video once or twice and go out and light off 100 acres of fire on your buddy's land. That would not be good and I'm not responsible for that. Fortunately, almost all states, either the forestry agency, the wildlife agency, or some combination of agencies have prescribed fire training courses. I know Missouri is hosting some classes coming up this spring. Missouri Department of Conservation about using prescribed fire, and many other states are doing the same. More and more states are recognizing the importance of reintroducing fire to the habitat to improve the quality of the habitat. But you need training or at least get in somebody's back pocket and walk along on several fires before you implement a fire on your land. And if it's your first fire, small is better. 
Start with a half acre, start with an acre, have some help there, have good fire breaks. And then you create a black area and your next one may be two acres because now it's blowing into an area where there's no fuel. And that checkerboard pattern of getting a small area black, which becomes a huge fire break, and then adding on to that is a great way to start burning on a property. And I would be remiss if I didn't share that different states have different rules. We're very blessed in Missouri that our state works to protect the right for landowners to use prescribed fire. Other states are different. In Kentucky, there's a block of time you can only burn at night, which, gosh, that's a bit more dangerous to me. The humidity's lower, but you can't see what you're doing. You're stepping in holes, stuff like that. So you need to really check the state regulations where you are before you start using prescribed fire. Knowing the laws and how fire behaves is critical for using prescribed fire as a habitat improvement tool. Knowing how we should behave and what our mission is, is critical for having a successful life. And I encourage everyone to literally, of course, acknowledge the Creator and seek His will intentionally and apply it daily to your lives. Thanks for watching, Growing Deer.